Shares of Oscar Health soaring nearly 16% today after the health insurance company posted Q3 results, lifting its full-year earnings guidance and saying it's on track to achieve profitability by 2024. Joining me here on set, Oscar Health CEO Mark Bertolini. Mark, it's great to have you here. Great to be here, Morgan. Um, strong quarter, well-received. Uh, medical expense ratio was down. Premium revenue was up as you raised rates. I guess walk me through, because you're taking market share, so walk, walk me through um, how you continue this growth and how that profitability is achieved next year. Well, we took sort of a time out in 2023. Um, we had grown really strongly in 21 and 22, and we needed sort of keep things flat in 23 so we could get the organization in shape to be able to move toward profitability and to expand its lines of business. Um, being just in the ACA is a bit problematic in the long run. So we thought, you know, how can we get the company situated where we can generate the kind of capital we need to grow? Um, so we spent time looking at our expenses, where we spent our money on our projects, where we generated capital, and we've got the team sort of focused on making the company profitable this year. It's not been profitable prior to that. So we've now had three quarters of profitability in 2023. So in 2024, we'll move the whole holding company into, into profitability and start to implement a strategy. You are expanding your footprint, though, in the yes. ACA uh, exchanges. I, I guess so, so walk me through that versus when you talk about building out other, other businesses and other lines of revenue, what that mix is going to look like. Sure. So we're 165 new counties, um, 11 states. Uh, we're growing off of our current provider relationships, our provider contracts, where we know we have good cost structure and where we can get good rates in the community to be able to serve more people. So we're picking up 500,000 more lives that we can serve this year. Um, we'll grow by about uh, just short of 20% in membership and over 20% in revenue um, for January. That's the guidance we've been giving people. Um, that's sort of the ACA business. And we believe the ACA is here to stay. Um, it's got, it'll have 18.8 .8 million people in it next year. So, hmm. um, and, and, and when Texas starts talking about building its own exchange, I think we've got a product that's going to stick around for a lot of people, and we're, we, we love that. We think the whole market ought to be individual and digitized. So our, our organization, our platform is very digital forward, um, and we believe the individual market can happen for small group employers and middle market employers through a product called in, um, individual consumer health re reimbursement accounts. And so we're building out that platform as we speak. Uh, we're putting, we're going to we're hopefully launch that in 2025. Um, as we build it out through 2024. And then we want to get into the Medicare Advantage space, but using health systems to sign up their patients versus insurance companies signing up patients and then sending them to health systems. Uh, we believe that getting the middleman out of the, out of the middle, if you will, um, and allowing the people providing care to provide the service as well um, is, a, is a really powerful idea. What does that do? What does that enable in terms of, I guess, not only more uh, effective service or, or cost or care, but also the cost of that care? The cost of the care will be less expensive when you take out a lot of the middlemen in the process. Today, the insurance companies are making about 6% on revenue, um, which is a fairly high number. And if you look at the history over the last decade, Insurance companies have grown their, pro about 60% of their profit growth has been in Medicare Advantage with 20% of their membership. That's been sitting with the insurance companies and not with the health systems, which are now struggling to make, end meets with, make ends meet with inflation, mm -hmm. rising wages, et cetera. If we can move that margin potential to those health systems, they'll be able to provide better service at the site of care. What does that do long-term to healthcare inflation, which is still rising? Yes. That's a tough problem. I mean, let's talk about GLP-1s. Yes, I'm glad right? you brought it up. Designer drug, um, in a lot of ways, not for diabetics, but for a lot of people who want to be thin. And I think we need in this country to have a dialogue around the idea of if we're going to make people better, we need to make the whole quality of life and their lifestyle better, not just having a magic drug to make that go away. Now, for diabetics, it's a really important drug. It's helping save a lot of lives, diabetic type 1 or 2. But when we start extending it to other parts of the population, we just want to get skinny um, and look good in the beach in the summer. That's not really a great idea unless we can make some lifestyle changes. It will drive up costs if we extend the use of this drug beyond the diabetic population. Okay. Well, if you do look at the diabetic population or, or, or folks that are um, in a position to meaningfully benefit from it and maybe perhaps be able to use it a, as a form of almost preventative care. Right. 
Um, what is that? I guess what does that adoption rate look like within insurance? Because it isn't covered in many, many cases. So I guess what does this look like in terms of folding it into the care mix? I, I think it is covered in a lot. Of, some states mandate it. Okay. We provide we provide coverage for it. We provide coverage for diabetics as well, um, for people that are diagnosed with for the need for it. Um, and so we believe it's an appropriate drug for diabetics when it's diagnosed as part of their okay. uh, care pathway.